The Lord be with you and with thy spirit, let us pray. Blessed Lord, you've caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we would in such wise read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. That by patience, comfort, and instruction of thy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. We resume our work in the historiographer a journal for Episcopal, Episcopal historians and an article on the Easter Vigil. We're trying to keep the main thing the main thing. And it's hard when we're doing theological journals. End up running down bunny roll, bunny rabbit trails and miss and forget or be, have the Trinity in his glorious majesty eclipsed. Here we are on an article on the Easter Vigil. In a festive mood, talking about a service at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, the entire assemblage joined in another procession to the high altar. There the bishop presided at a festal Eucharist in which the newly baptized persons and the new confirmands joined the whole congregation in the ritual of bread and wine. Then with a prayer of thanksgiving, the second experimental Easter vigil is a cathedral of the Episcopal Church ended in a mood which was one and at the same time solemnly meditative and joyful. In general, it was reinvigoration of the fourth century Milanese outline for an Easter vigil. It was, after all, the academic investigations, the preparation and revision of a text, the ecclesiastical permissions, the conduct of the event, and the evaluations and final round of revisions was done. But the text and rubrics were provided to Dr. Shepard for transmission to the Standing Liturgical Commission. For obvious reasons, Dr. Hockbong spent many nervous weeks after the materials were in the hands of the Standing Liturgical Commission. He later was told that the commission was forward, forwarded the text to W. H. Auden, the noted British poet, for comment. As it turned out, Auden had no suggestions for change and the vigil outline and related materials were formally presented to the Standing Liturgical Commission for comment. Let me skip some of this, blah, blah, blah. Anglo-Catholics make changes in ways which are still shrouded in mystery. Additions were made by Anglo-Catholic group, which seemed to include Bishop Paul Moore, whereas the experimental service included an abbreviated version of Exultet. A longer historical set was included. Whereas the approved material indeed multiplied multiple suggestions for scripture lessons, a fixed set was provided. The experimental rite made no provision for or included no sermon. What was printed included a homiletic option to each lesson, and a sermon was added after the renewal of baptismal vows. The changes were seriously, the changes which were made seriously offended Shepard, especially because they were done in a hidden way. Several years later, on behalf of the Liturgical Renewal Commission in the Diocese of California, under a different chairperson, I was invite. I was inviting Shepherd to speak at the forthcoming diocesan conference about the Easter Vigil. That seemed to be an easy ask with guaranteed acceptance. To my surprise, he firmly and curtly refused. I stammered in surprise and tried to importune him. He said, no, that part of my life is over. That 
too, was a stunning comment attended with a tone of great and firm finality. When I inquired as to why he was took that stance, since he had been intimately involved in the development of the vigil, he responded, we did what we did on the vigil and sent it to New York. Then those damned Anglo-Catholics in New York did what they did with it, and I want no more to do with it. <clears throat> I commented that I was asking in behalf of the local commission and for a local conference, and that in our context, he would have full freedom to say whatever he wanted to say, including criticism of what had been done to the service. He continued firm in his denial. The issue was that what had been submitted and approved included a great deal of flexibility, while what emerged from New York was much more limited in options and more rigid in requirements. Now for the National Catholic Register, an article on public schools versus parents. And the woke theology. Without Isaiah's God. Avoiding discrimination against students who say they are transgender is vital to a healthy school atmosphere, school committee supporters say, quote, parents and public schools work in partnership to help young people grow and thrive. Our public schools are tasked with providing a safe learning environment and equal educational opportunities for all students, bar none. And that includes transgender and gender non-conforming students. Both school experience and research show that a safe and positive climate promotes academic success for students, said Mary Bonauto, an attorney for GLBGTQ, legal advocates and defenders, by email to the register via an assistant. They're on the march. They're coming for the children. Unreasonable actions. The actions of school officials were not reasonable, says the Family Institute of Connecticut's Friend of the Court brief, submitted by Massachusetts lawyer Carl Schmidt. If any other type of health care treatment were at issue here, brief states, school officials could not, with a straight face, claim the right to do what they have done to children in this case. But because the case is set in the context of gender identity issues, defendants feel uncomfortable asserting that they had the right and indeed the obligation to administer a potentially damaging mental health care treatment the children without parental consent. Whether gender identity is changeable is also a matter of dispute in the landmark case. Lawyers for the Ludlow School Committee cite a 2020 federal court ruling in Virginia, Grimm versus Gloucester County School Board, that relying on experts found that gender identity is often established between ages three and four, and that being transgender is not a psychiatric condition, is not a choice, and is as natural and immutable as being cisgender. Cisgender is a word coined in 1994 that refers to cases where a person's gender identity matches up with their biological sex, as is the case with 99% of people. On the other side, a friend of the court brief filed by the Family Institute of Connecticut cites a 2008 study 
finding that a significant number of adolescent girls have reported gender dysphoria fueled by online sources and peers, what the brief calls social contagion. The study drew on 256 interviews completed by parents of children who had announced a transgender identification. The children had a mean age of 15.2 years when they made this disclosure and more than 80% were girls. Most, 86.7% of the parents reported this along with sudden or rapid onset of gender dysphoria. Their child either had an increase in their social media internet use and belonged to a friend group in which one or multiple friends became transgender identified during a time frame or both. The study concluded. Nihilism said Professor A. A. Hodge, when you remove theology, when you remove Isaiah's God. There's another article on religious freedom at stake in the November election and the critics' concern over the Equality Act. If the Equality Act becomes law, religious freedom objections to it could not rely on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993, which says that government shall not substantially burden a person's exercise of religion unless in furtherance of a compelling government interest, because the Equality Bill prohibits using that statute as a basis for a defense claim. The Equality Act bill also would make explicit that existing federal statutes prohibiting sex discrimination in employment (coughs) including access to health care, housing, and so forth would also prohibit sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination. Describe so-called conversion therapy in which psychotherapist guides a person with same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria to overcome such feelings as discredited and a form of discrimination that harms LBGTQ people and would open single-sex facilities nationwide to transgender people on the basis of their gender they identify with, including a restroom, a locker room, dressing room. If the legislation is passed, some critics envision the end of single-sex dormitories at religious colleges that accept federal funding because biological males who identify as women would have a right to live in women's dorms and vice versa. Some say the bill might also be used to require doctors and hospitals to provide abortions even if they object on moral grounds. The bill never mentions the word abortion, but it includes among its rules the following pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. National Catholic Register again, yes, December 4 edition. School board success. We do not co-parent with the government. Nice slogan, but you got public schools. If family education regains prominence, many things will change for the better. It's time for fathers and mothers to return from exile. They've exiled themselves from educating their children and slowly reassume their educative role, the Pope said in May 2015. 
nice happy talk, but no change massively. Gains among parents' right candidates have taken place in conservative areas, but also in swing areas. In Frederick County, Maryland, one of the newly elected Board of Education members is Nancy Allen, a member of the slate called Education, Not Indoctrination, whose members criticize the current board of education over sex education curriculum. Quote, this curriculum is not age appropriate for the five to eight year olds and takes away from the focus on academics. The family unit, no matter what the makeup of the family is or looks like for a student, is where the values and morals are taught. It is a parent's decision to decide where and when to have that discussion with their child about sex, Alan said during the Board of Education meeting. Now for the National Catholic Register. An article entitled Respect for Marriage Act opens new legal issues. Critics predict discrimination against those who hold traditional views. Washington, this is by Loretta Brown, a newly enacted law to codify same-sex civil marriage must have given the government and activist groups new ammunition against those who adhere to long-standing view that marriage is between one man and one woman. The U.S. bishops and religious freedom groups are warning that the recent passage of the Respect for Marriage Act purportedly aimed merely to uphold the protections afforded to same-sex couples in the Supreme Court ruling over the fell v. Hodges decision in fact opens up new legal ag avenues for targeting people of faith and others who dissent on the issue. The measure passed the House by 257 to 168 on December 8, the day the register went to press. It was expected to be signed into law by President Joe Biden requiring civil marriages be performed out of state. It formally repeals the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act. The Supreme Court's 2015 Oberfell decision currently requires all states to allow same-sex civil marriage, but the legislation was proposed following concerns that Obergefell may be overturned. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote in his concurring opinion in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health in June that the Supreme Court should reconsider substantive, substantive due process precedents, including Obergefell. However, many observers argued that these concerns were unfounded as Justice Samuel Alito stated in the Dobbs majority opinion that the decision concerns the right to abortion and no other right. The critics of the bill warn that it goes beyond simply codifying Obergefell and provides a new basis for the government and outside organizations to target those who believe in traditional marriage. Matt Sharp, Senior Counsel and State Government Relations Director of the Alliance Defending Freedom, told, told Register that the bill provides the government with broad new powers to punish organizations. This is a very large paper. Excuse me. Article will be 
on abortion bans now in the hands of state judges. Predict legal chaos for the decades ahead, decade ahead of us. We turn now to Anglican Journal October issue. And I think I will skip that article. Churches face unique challenges getting to net zero, a researcher. That's on carbon emissions, and we are gloriously done for finding this journal to be unedifying. Why different views of marriage if we're all made in the image of God? In response, this is by Tim Kennedy of St. James Anglican Church, Port Colburn, Ontario. In response to page one headline of the September Anglican Journal, Lambeth Conference affirms diversity of views on sexuality and marriage. I have a question. Eucharist Prayer 1 in the Book of Alternative Services states, you created all things, you formed us in your own image, close quote. Does that not indicate that God is female, male, LGBTQ, black, white, Asian, indigenous, and any other form of humanity? What then is the argument and why then is there such a diversity of views? Since we're all in God's image, there should not be any division between who should and sh who shouldn't be able to be married. And so says the Reverend, if we say one race, two genders, that's how we're recreated. All these saints I'm supposed to be communing with the primer on the heroes of faith. One more. In Anglican Journal, we finish with Linda Nichols. Um, recovering the blessing of Amitha's heritage. When I was first asked to contribute an article to Anglican Journal, I was surprised, especially when it explained to me that I was being asked to write from an indigenous perspective. Everything's about race with these guys. He's the Dean of Diocese of Brandon and Rector of St. Matthew's Cathedral. In somewhere in Manitoba. You see, I'm a citizen of Red River Metis, but my experience hasn't really reflected that. And if you were to look at me, his name is Don Bernard, you would likely never guess my heritage. I grew up in a home where we never spoke about being Metis, what Metis means, or Metis culture and traditions. In a word, I grew up in the same way as all my non-indigenous friends. So who am I to try and write and speak for anyone? But in a way, the experience might be the one that I can offer. How does someone like me go about learning who they are? who their grandparents and great-grandparents are and what being a Metis means. I feel I don't have the experience of being an indigenous person in Canada, but many do. And those people have experiences and teachings to share. So in my world, the simple answer, which actually isn't all that simple, is to listen. Listening can seem dangerous. If we open ourselves to learning the experiences of First Nations, Inuit and Met Metis people in this country, especially as members of the Anglican Church, we must be prepared for things that will at times be very difficult to hear. 
I walked alongside indigenous people and heard their stories. There's usually a lot of laughter, but there's also pain, trauma, grief, and occasionally anger. These stories can be very difficult. I must for I hear a bit of my grandparents and my great grandparents. I also hear the voices of those who've been injured by the church calling us to remember our own sacred stories, like the Incarnation. The Christmas story reminds us that God came into the world, not for a specific group of people, but for all of us. We know what before the, that first Christmas night, God had always been work, at work in the world, wherever his beloved children were. We might not have called him by the same name or worshipped him the same way, but there was a relationship. When I hear the traditional stories of God as told by indigenous elders and watch their sacred ceremonies, it is clear to me that God did not arrive with the Europeans. Recently, I heard a Dakota teaching about how the Creator made humans as part of his creation, not to be placed above it. There was no God gave them dominion in their understanding. They were intimately connected to everything around them, to the world itself. Their creation story recognized God made all things and had been with them from the beginning. Our indigenous sisters and brothers tried to explain that to the arriving settlers in the church, but few listened. Imagine if they had. I'm still learning, still doing my best to listen. I wrestle with what being metis means and how it shapes who I am. I doubt that in this world I'll ever figure it out completely. More on race, guilt. Again, and again, and again, nowhere to go. More Canadians on the brink of homelessness advocate today. Another article, Bishops Find Hope Despite Divisions at Lambeth. We'll persist with that. It's got a picture here of all the bishops at Lambeth from summer. Turn now to Anglican and Episcopal history, still continuing with the French Huguenots. But for immigrants who did not know Bertrand in France, the decision to go to the Rappahannock region likely revolved around one crucial issue that made this refuge fundamentally different from all the others existing at the time. Whatever the exiles may have hoped to find in Virginia, they migrated knowing they would be Anglicans once they arrived in the New World. They knew they could not preserve a distinctive French Reformed Church in a colony where the Anglican Church was the only recognized communion. Going to Virginia meant giving up the dream of creating a Huguenot Eden in the New World. Those who could not let go of that dream could choose other destinations in the New World, Carolina, New York, or New England, where independent Huguenot congregations were being organized to serve as anchors for the refugee communities. The prospect of living as Anglicans in Virginia may have been particularly appealing to Huguenots who entertained another dream, actively resisting their former king whose proscription of Protestantism had turned their world upside down. As Huguenot Anglicans in Virginia, they would be part of the Anglican-led Protestant bulwark Compton was trying to construct in the New World. 
to oppose militant Roman Catholicism of Louis XIV. The appeal of this dream could well have been strengthened by world events that were unfolding as the refuge was taking shape. The ascension of Louis XIV's European opponent, William of Orange, to the English throne in 1689 England's new role as the leader of the Protestant International, resisting Louise's global ambitions and England's long period of warfare with France, 1689 to 1697, 1702 to 1713. The bottom line for many of these refugees may have been the one outlined by Durand. Huguenots seeking to acquire land on which others would labor and enjoy French Protestant preaching in English America could do both in the refuge that was forming along the Rappahannock River in Virginia. Records show that a substantial number of Huguenot exiles became landholders in this part of Virginia. Moreover, through the overlapping ministries of Bertrand and three other Huguenot Anglican clergy who followed him to the Rappahannock region, the refuge was served by French-speaking ministers from 1687 to 1732. And we will resume that in our next edition. Almighty God, give us grace that we may always cast off the works of darkness and put on us the armor of light now in the time of this mortal life in which Jesus Christ came in great humility. That in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the quick and the dead, we may greet him with joy and acclamation and rise to the life immortal. Through him who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end.